Um, welcome, and thanks for coming out this Sunday. Uh, I want to just, uh, again, introduce myself. I'm Joaquin Alvarado. I'm the CEO at the Center for Investigative Reporting. I'm also a huge fan of the writers we're going to be speaking with today. Before we get there, I want to actually thank um, all of the sponsors who made this possible, uh, including Margaret and Will Hurst for their gener generosity in supporting this. Um, they're also uh, major supporters of the center, so we really do appreciate their support for all of this good work. Literature Translation Institute of Korea, LTI Korea, thank you very much. The Consulate General of Mexico in San Francisco, um, thanks to them for their support. And the state of Jalisco, uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks for your support also. And if there's anybody here from the state of Jalisco, I definitely want to meet you later because that's one of my favorite states in Mexico. Um, okay, with that, um, I want to just go down the line here and quickly tell you who's in this conversation, and then we're going to dive right in. A few ground rules. We definitely want audience engagement and questions. Um, please make them amazing questions to help drive this conversation along. Um, so take a little time to, to prepare that and, and bring your, your A game to it because you're going to get incredible um, feedback and, and responses and, and insights from the folks we've got on the, on the, in the conversation here. Um, also, when you have a question, we have somebody in the back who will bring you a microphone. And it's really important that um, you speak clearly into the mic because this is also going to turn into a podcast so that others can, can take advantage of, of, of what we're able to do here together in person. And I, I will say that this is like having a book club, uh, this panel of uh, authors that I am big fans of. Um, so when we started to put this together, and I saw that you all were available for the conversation we wanted to have, I just almost couldn't take it. So um, to my immediate left, uh, let me introduce Guadalupe Netel, uh, who's joining us from Mexico City. Um, to her left is Vanessa Hua, who is based in the Bay Area here. Uh, and to her left is Chris Lee, and uh, we did a little prep before we got in here, and I, I'm going to start off with what is a broad topic, immigration, but treated with great um, uh, sophistication and real complexity in all of their writings. But I thought we would, in this exploration of what it means to be inside and outside of some of the many borders that um, are, are currently locking in not only our politics, but some of our culture and, um, and our abilities to relate and connect with one another, uh, I'll start with you, Guadalupe. How does immigration factor into your work? How do you respond, um, both as a journalist and a writer, to the pressures that are put on the issue of, of immigration and migration uh, in today's world? Well, um, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, the first time I was exposed to immigration, it was when I was a little kid, because I used to live in Mexico in a neighborhood called Villa Olimpica, that some of you may know where was the um, headquarters of the Latin American exile. So we were, I, I was, I had neighbors who came from Argentina, uh, Uruguay, Chile, and other countries who were persecuted by the dictatorships. Some of them just arrived with one parent and the other was tortured or disappeared or murdered. And that was my first um, contact with them, we were, we were raised together, and some of them went back to their countries and wrote uh, and want to come back to Mexico, and some of them want to to write about them, about about the neighborhood, and about oh, what was our childhood together, as I did in my novel, uh, The Body Where I Was Born. So the title, <laughs> it's it's after an Allen Ginsberg uh, poem, which I like very much. And it's about become, oh, coming back where we were born and we never wanted to accept. So after that, with my family, we went to France because my mother was studying, but we went into the banlieue, which is the Arabic uh, neighborhood, and it wasn't so fun. As <laughs> we can imagine uh, a lot of Cars were stolen and burned there. There were a lot of fights and also um, women beat it by, by their husbands and things like that. So it was the first time where I was a foreigner. And um, I, I was not from the exile, but I, I was living with them again. They were from um, Morocco and Tunisia and a lot of different countries from the north of Africa. 
and became familiar with their culture in a way. I wasn't part of them, but I had the feeling that we were both, uh, we all were strangers and foreigners. So later on, I went on traveling during all my life and meeting people from different diasporas. And I think that it's definitely not something that as you or, or in the, the rich countries as France can imagine, which is people coming to invade us, poor people coming to cross our borders and to invade us. But it's, it's, a, it's a circular thing. It's something that gives and takes. It's, it's an exchange of culture. I wouldn't be at all myself if I hadn't um, meet all these people from different countries and learn from their different cultures and experiences. And that's exactly the kind of literature I like to, to read, like Isaac Bashevi here and, well, I'll stop here because I want to hear. Well, well <laughs> uh, in, in <laughs> that, going in that direction, I'll, I'll, I'll move over to Vanessa. Your short stories uh, often settle into the lives of, of folks who have migrated into a community uh, and we see them differently than we do normally in our in our day to days, where we might be able to pass these folks by. You expose that, and you bring up the dynamics in their own life. I'm thinking about the short story you've got uh, about the the marriage of of Mexican migrants and the mission, as it sort of evolves, and and they confront their own exile. Can you talk a little bit about bringing more? Um, exposure to what is actually going on in these lives versus the high-level politics that often oversimplify the dynamics around immigration? Sure. I mean, I think often the sound bite that gets repeated, uh, bad hombres or uh, murderers and rapists, is just sort of like the one-note portrayal, like a, a flat character um, that, you know, people, immigrants are demonized when in fact um, their lives and their stories are much more complex. And so um, I think immigration and identity is a major theme of my work, whether it be about Chinese Americans or Latino immigrants or there's Korean um, uh, American, Japanese Americans in my book. Um, and it's about really getting at their singular experience um, that I think combats stereotypes and, uh, you know, increases the ability for, for us to have empathy and understanding. And, and does it, what's the reaction you get from, do you interact with these immigrant communities in your development of the stories? How do you do your research to then produce these stories? Yes, I mean, there is a, um, so, for example, the story about the Latino immigrant boy, I was living in the mission, you know, I felt, you know, that was my community, but I was also reporting on them, um, you know, I was covering emerging communities uh, in the in the Bay Area as a, as a reporter, whether they be Asian or, or Latino. Um, and so it's about getting at their stories. It's about um, researching, like there's research papers, and then also talking to people from the community too, to, to have them um, to, to take a look at it. And it's not a matter of like, no one person can speak for the community. I just want my character to be able to speak for themselves. But um, just really, moving from a place of humbleness and not arrogance and assumption if you are writing about people whose lives are, are different than yours. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it down. Um, Chris Lee wrote a book which is actually um, told through the lens of, of a handful of characters who are migrating <laughs> on some level, not only uh, across borders, but in their relationships. Uh, there's a lot of movement in there. Um, and I'm wondering, when you take a situation like we've got you know, on the Korean Peninsula, which is about as polarized as you can get, how do you create breathing room for real lives to be at the center of your story? Um, I had been part of the community as an act, the, the North Korean uh, refugee community as an activist and as a friend for uh, many years before I actually started um, writing the book, um, uh, my novel. And it was something that you know, it was the book that I didn't want to write that I ended up feeling very compelled to write because um, the way that they were being depicted at that time in both the Korean press as well as in the Western media and um, in Korean novels, ironically. Uh, South Korean novelists would occasionally approach me and say, oh, so I've written a novel about uh, North Koreans and uh, um, I, you know, I heard you know a lot of North Koreans. Can you introduce me to some because I want to fact check. 
I was like, so why did you write this novel and you've written these complex characters without actually having any idea of who they are outside of this um, you know, distant archival uh, research? I, I just, of course, uh, I, I, I protect um, my, my friends in that community because many people try to use them. And so I, I did start writing with this desire to show that you know, the all, uh, to almost have, to almost have the North Korean there without the North Korean-ness in a sense, as in, um, you know, the, the, the title is How I Became a North Korean very deliberately because many people, I think including myself and anyone who leaves the country, starts to see and be perceived as the nationality, the citizenship um, that, you, uh, that you were born with or that you inherited through your family or through your marriage. And uh, North Koreans, when they leave, they start to be persecuted, uh, to be terrorized, uh, kidnapped, uh, discriminated against because of their citizenship. And they are stripped of what it means to be a human being. And, and so um, uh, I try to write out of that knowledge of what I knew of them and the spirit of them, but I didn't write them in particular, as in this is a recognizable human being or a character. And I did have North Korean friends, uh, one particular uh, young man who came to me with five years worth of diary entries, and he said, please write me into the book. And, and I said- Did you read his diary? <laughs> I knew enough about it. I did not. I, I read maybe like you know he you know when, while he was watching me, he wanted me to read it there in front of him, <laughs> and I read either you know I read a few pages and I was like and I knew him already, and it was more a sense of you know that what happens is they often commit things or commit to things or tell their stories and then they later regret it, and so I as as a rule I do not use. Uh, those stories, even if they ask me to, because I tell them, once the story is out, you can never take that back. In some sense, though, um, there's, a, there's a narrative that, um, that media all over the world creates around migrants and immigration issues where their lives are written for them. So what is that balance that you have to strike between representing authentically you know, the folks that you guys all know personally but also uh, observing their right to some privacy and some, some of their own secret spaces. So uh, in your novel, Guadalupe, um, you, you're, it's told through the lens of, of uh, a person in their therapy. Um, so you can't get more intimate than that. Um, how did you kind of manage that? And I don't know how much is autobiographical or biographical, but, but how do you balance the, the need for intimacy and authenticity in representing real lives, but also some of the political and familial complications of, of just raw honesty. Well, in that novel, I said it's noble, but actually it's a, it's a memoir. I can't tell you for <clears throat> many <laughs> minutes why is it is a novel, why I say it's a novel, but it's not what you're asking, so. <laughs> you can answer whatever question you want, too. <laughs> Especially if it's better than mine. <laughs> No, no, yours is very good. <laughs> Do so, both. Um, what, what I tell there is 100% the truth, but I decided to, to tell it in a, in a literary way with a certain decisions that you take as a novelist. But what you were saying is true, that sometimes you, you have to represent a country, actually, even if you don't want. You are Mexican, so you have to represent all the people who want to cross the borders and so on. So it's difficult to write without thinking about how it's going to be read. read. So um, what I tried in that novel, specifically in that one, because I, tr I, I talk about the, the migration process or, or experience in other novels too from, from the fiction point of view. But that novel is, is a story of what I lived and the people who lived around me at that time. And I tried to really tell the stories of them, not, not inventing any character. So that's how I, I stayed honest. So there is a scene from the book, which I highly recommend everybody read, um, where the family, or the, the, the character goes to the city of Juarez, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there's a whole sort of set of scenes and dynamics around that, but it's right before the city 
descends into the kind of violence that it's now known for. And I thought it was a really effective way to sort of put that tension out there, that there was a time when Mexico was not overrun by this narco war that's happening, right, and, and the re response of the federal government there. Um, what were you doing by having, what, what about that visit to Juarez? So in Juarez, where my cousin, we were a very dysfunctional family, actually. <laughs> my parents were- Say more. Yeah, separated. <laughs> Uh, they, they were absolutely obsessed by an issue of my view, so they, want me, they wanted me to see all kind of ophthalmologists wherever they could find one. And, and, those, and, and they were also from the 70s, they were very involved in the, in the social changes and this dream of changing the world and the hippie stuff and so on. <laughs> And, and my family in Ciudad Juarez was absolutely the opposite. They were like the classic family with an authoritarian father and a very uh, humble and obedient mother. So they were like the Fisher Price family. And, <laughs> and for me, it was like a paradise. Juarez was a, a, the perfect world. Actually, I couldn't recognize it later on when I read all these news in the newspapers. Interesting. Um, Vanessa, uh, and again, we'll start to mix it up. Think about your questions or comments. Um, uh, Deceit and Other Possibilities is a collection of short stories. Um, and there's a theme throughout these, and I'll call out The Shot, um, which is a, a short story that's set on an Inland Empire. Uh, golf course. Golf course, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there's, there's a certain amount of tension in interpersonal relationships throughout this book, but that one I thought was particularly sharp because it's this melting pot public golf course. The golf, public golf courses in Southern California are among the most diverse, I'd say, in the country or if not the world. Say more. <laughs> well, I must confess I am not a golfer, but my husband is, and he would tell me, uh, and the thing about golf, I guess you show up and you can just play with people you meet that day. And I thought, that's odd. Like, if I'm a woman, I'm going shopping. I don't go to another woman and say, hey, do you want to go shopping with me? <laughs> but I just thought it was just so fascinating that this place could bring people together like that. Um, and because you think uh, country club, hoity-toity, just very homogenous, when in fact, um, you know, my husband mentioned like, oh, yeah, this guy was smoking a joint. He offered me a joint um, another time. And then these cart ladies who will, you can buy drinks from. I'm like, how could, why are you playing sports? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I just thought it was this really rich area to explore. And so the main character um, in that story is half, um, half, uh, half Asian, half white. His uh, wife who's leaving him is- But Arm Serbian, Serbian, ethnically Serbian. Oh, so, right? And yeah, yeah half yeah, Serbian, yeah. half, yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah, that was, you know, living in Southern California, just meeting all these other sort of ethnic communities um, and and then just um, the, the, the the golf courses I had read about there were these incidents like there's one golf course was known for having um, hookers in the hospitality tents and so What's going on? Is police, this a, like a Tilden we're talking exactly we right about right if only and the the police like had a whole sting operation um, there was another incident where a gun was pulled and so that's when I sort of thought like okay these, all these elements are coalescing. So uh, this is where, can, you know, there's a, a flashpoint, a conflict that I wanted yeah. to explore in the story. So I, I, what I love about it is it's, it, it, we think of immigration and migrants as somewhere else, but you make it proximate. You put them next to each other. Doing the things that all of us yes. do. And there is a line in, in the book, which I won't give away the, the or excuse me, the short story, I won't give away the ending, but uh, he, is, he is in a conflicted relationship with his wife who is Armenian-American. Yeah. But they share a common uh, uh, history of having been oppressed by the Turks. The, the yeah, I believe Ottomans. the line is, we were all screwed by the Turks. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you create this community around the experience of oppression, but then it, it boils over in the course of the short story. Um, that boiling over uh, is happening between people in a, in a real setting. Um, does that something that you think about often, that it's not going to be the, the, the federal government where the boiling over could happen, but it, that it could erupt in a public golf course in the Inland Empire? Um, what do you think of this? I mean, I think it happens. I mean, there's ice raids happening every day, but it's true. We, conflict happens with the people 
we're right up next to. So, but that's also where understanding come, can come as well. Yeah. Um, do you feel like your characters can get resolution at the end of these short stories? Because I, I leave each one of them having read them thinking, I don't know if this is resolved or not. Yeah, I think my stories tend to end with it gets worse before it gets better, but I do. <laughs> I do think there's always that moment of grace where there's some possibility. Well, I'm going to pivot to the question of Christianity, which maybe there is a theme of it gets better before, worse before it gets better. But um, uh, in, in Chris's book, um, Christianity is treated as a real force, as a personal force, as a political force uh, in the process where folks get out of uh, North Korea. Um, how did you come to, to introduce religion in the way that you did, especially with Danny's character also? Um, can you reflect on that a bit? I, you know, I, I grew up in the church. I was a pastor's kid, um, and uh, it was something that, you know, on a on kind of a, both a mythological and a cellular level was always present for me. And uh, it, you know, you can, I, I like to say you can leave the church, but the church never leaves you. And I really discovered that when I, when I began writing fiction. Um, and within the, you know, the activist community, over 98% of the people really on the ground, whether it's in South Korea or at the Chinese border area, are um, missionaries or they are, you know, uh, ev evangel ev evangelical Christians. And, um, you know, you, you're in an area that's incredibly dangerous. You know, there are now assassination attempts. The man I worked with to set up a safe house in China is now dead. He was tortured in a Chinese jail and uh, um, I died two years, uh, was it uh, maybe three years ago? So this, uh, this, this area, it's going to not only attract Christians, it attracts a particular kind of Christian because of the high danger level that is also in some ways a high reward level. Like here you are really saving lives, souls, they think. Um, and that happens uh, whether it's in the Middle East or whether it's in uh, Korea, different places of danger where people are at risk and they're the most vulnerable. Um, and it, the, I think, I, I love that expression, Christianity as a political force, um, because that's really what it is. Uh, growing up in the church, I really thought of, first I thought my father must be God because <laughs> this is, you know, as a kid, this is the, the hierarchy that you grow up with. But then realizing that the church, like all social organizations, um, has competing forces, especially within the immigrant church, uh, a hierarchy, a system, and different motivations. And when you bring that kind of, um, you know, mission uh, in contact with a refugee population that has no rights, no freedom, and is absolutely vulnerable to whatever you decide is good for them, it's a really dangerous, terrible combination. And, um, you know, that was, uh, ultimately, I came into great conflict with uh, the missionary, one of the missionaries I was working with um, at the border area. There was an all-night argument, and there are moments definitely from the book that are from life, but much of it is inspired by life, but this was directly uh, from um, what happened. He looked at me, and he said, you're on the activist side, and I'm on the Christian side. And I just thought, I thought we were working for the same thing, for the safety of these people. But I learned that night we were not. Wow, um, that's haunting. Uh, reactions, or I, I want to pull on one thing you mentioned. So um, the person who was tortured and killed, um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And how, how do you know? Who reported that out? Um, he was, uh, so, so what happened was, he was a very complicated man, as, again, everyone who really works at the border is. Um, and uh, he, he, basically, we came to uh, great conflict because one of the people that we had um, gotten, you know, we'd, he'd, he'd already been out, but he was, you know, we got him into a safe house. Um, he was out of the public eye. He, uh, he, he and I got to know each other a bit whenever... Um, uh, we were alone, and he would speak very differently, and he begged me. Uh, he got on his knees, actually. He begged me to help him because he said, this man wants to send me back to North Korea to preach the word of God. He said, you have to get me out. Um, and he said, if you don't help me, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's over. So uh, that's what I did, of course. I tried to cooperate with him first. That wasn't working. And then I had to basically 
help the man escape without the knowledge of the the Christian community that was that were not willing to let him go. Um, and so we, you know, after that, there were uh, recriminations. There was a death threat made against me because there's gang members that were. I mean, it's it's a very it's a crazy world. Um, I had lunch with a gang member at the border area. <laughs> it, was, it was this kind of a world. And it, after this happened, a, about a year, a, maybe a year or two after that, this uh, man who I had helped escape, who I've had a long relationship with now in South Korea, even though he was so angry at this man who had done this to him, over time, of course, he's had so much time to think in South Korea, and he thought, Though this man was wrong and he did many terrible things to him, uh, he also was caring and he also did save his life in a way. And uh, he'd always kind of kept in touch with the man's older brother. Um, and this is how we, the news was coming back to us of what happened to him when he was caught uh, for his activities, brought to jail. And I knew he had certain health problems. Um, and then in, you know, in the Chinese jail later, um, you know, he, he died. But he's not the only one. There's, a, there's been many uh, people who have been tortured and died or been declared dead and then been so-called brought back to life. In so uh, be getting ready if you're interested in, in getting into the conversation here. But I'm going to turn back to Guadalupe on this question of how we get information out of these conflict areas. Uh, you mentioned Juarez, and as you've read about how the city has turned over the last 20 years to one of the most violent places on the planet, especially for women, um, you are an editor yourself. Um, there may be no more dangerous country on earth right now to be a journalist than Mexico. Absolutely. Uh, well, <clears throat> journalists are murdered now in Mexico, like, especially in some states like Veracruz. It's they don't have any protection by the state or the government or whatever. So they have like two forces against them. One is definitely the narco because they don't want people to talk about what they're doing or their movements of their cars and charts and anything. And also is of course um, the government. I mean the, the local government which very often are very cynical about all this death. So being a journalist in Mexico is, is one of the most dangerous um, professions that people can have. And we have very, very brave people um, fighting and exposing their lives or risking their lives every day just because they want to, the truth to be said. So those are really like heroes and actually in, during the literary festivals, as the Hay Festival that takes place every year in Querétaro, the, the more attended panels are definitely the journalist ones, where Carmen Aristegui speaks or Diego Enrique Sorno, people like them, because pe the, the audience is absolutely um, thirsty about what they have to say. They, the only thing that they believe is not the official version, but the journalist version. So, so from your vantage point uh, in Mexico City, when you see uh, the President of the United States, which uh, should take, we should be very proud of our First Amendment, right, to protect a free press, describe the press as an enemy, and rail against it as an illegitimate force aligned against him and working class people, how do you react? <laughs> well, now it, it, it's, it's really almost like unbelievable, the things that he's been saying about Mexicans, for instance, like we are all rapists or all criminals and things like that. You can't, pay, you can't take it seriously, actually. It's like a clown is governing the United States. That's what is happening. But he has the nuclear code. <laughs> <laughs> but in another way, we know that a lot of people are going to suffer and are already suffering because of that. Oh, this, I, I've been coming to the, uh, the, the States many times since I was a kid to see ophthalmologists, of course. <laughs> but also because I have family living in San Diego and other 
country and, and other cities in, in the country. So I never had problems to come and go from the States. And this is the first time where I was in the secondary screen arriving to the airport here now, like two days ago, and I saw how it is. Many people don't speak uh, English, they don't understand what's going on, they don't understand what the police is saying. And you know, like I was saying, oh, so somebody, so any, anybody is so smiley and so kind outside in the streets. I wonder how this policeman, who is so rude towards all the people who are here, is when he comes out, I was wondering this morning, is this guy, does this guy take the same when he's in, in the street? Or is it just a role? Or he really believes what he's doing? On you should what definitely he's doing? write that story, because that's, uh, that's kind of a profound way to, to see it. You've had this lifelong, really, experience of coming, right, and, and connecting and having family. Um, but I do think there's a risk here. And also, raise your hand if you do have a question, because we need to coordinate mics here. So we, we got one down in the front, a couple here. Any on the wings? OK. Um, uh, Vanessa, there is a tendency to, especially in the US, from The Daily Show to John Oliver, to turn bad news into, into funny comedy satire you know, and, and sarcasm. So is there a danger? that people will not take this serious enough until it's too late. And there is some real threat to our ability to um, not only um, have journalists do their job, but really even to potentially protect their safety in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone kept saying like, well, even if he wins, he'll, he'll change. But that we, we, people got what they got. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, I think in some ways, I would actually think the fact that I'm glad it's on you know, mass media and The Daily Show because they're not going to necessarily sit down and watch um, PBS NewsHour, as great as PBS NewsHour is. Love the NewsHour. Yes, but just um, it's at least putting our attention on it. Um, but that's always that question of like, what does, how do you translate clicking like on a video to um, taking action of some sort? So, but I mean, the first step is consciousness um, of, of the issue and e even if that comes through the, the lens of humor. In some way, that's, it might get people who would never read the news. And so I do think it's important. Um, oh, the entry is just, the, it's, that's just the beginning, so. And, and in terms of the uh, polarization, the great divide that's happening, uh, certainly in the United States, but in many parts of the world, that's fueling both nationalism and also this sort of uh, uh, polarizing media environment. Um, in, in South Korea recently, you guys impeached your president. Uh, uh, how, how is that polarization playing out? Again, probably the most polarized place on the planet. No suggestions here are being offered. <laughs> You know, the, the impeachment of our um, president, Park geun was, uh, it was greatly empowered and helped by the media. The, this is, a, in some ways, it's a growing democracy. It's a very new democracy in South Korea. And uh, uh, one of the major uh, uh, cable news stations that people watch today, JTBC, which is the equivalent of CNN, um, put great pressure on the prosecutors on telling the truth that people were trying to hide because people protect other people of power. Uh, uh, the cronyism is rampant in, in the country. And that uh, helped fuel anger. It fueled pressure and eventually to have a million people out on the streets repeatedly um, created what I, you know, in some ways we were all hopeful for, but skeptical of, which was, uh, you know, the end of a incredibly corrupt regime and, and, and justice brought to uh, a, a country where the rich are basically generally untouchable. Um, and our new president is very pro uh, uh, North Korean relations, and uh, I think the North Korean government uses whatever is happening in South Korea media it, as propaganda. So, uh, ironically, whatever is happening with Trump here and the anti-North Korean uh, dialogue that he's was well, anti everywhere it seems uh, is being used directly by the government and kind of empowering them. So it's it's interesting how like even domestic news uh, will affect countries and be manipulated by countries, but also that uh, the way that media and news I've seen can actually create social change that just didn't even seem possible. Mm. Very good, okay, let's get a question in. Down in front. 
Uh, we've got yellow t-shirt here, yeah. That's your handle now on Twitter, by the way, yellow t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm a Mexican-American. I'm biracial. Um, because of the situation with the election, I became activated and uh, I am visiting people in immigration detention. And I was struck by something uh, that Chris said about um, telling people not, not to speak about their stories because it can be dangerous if you say it. It's out there and you can't change it. And I understand that because on the one hand, um, I work with people that have family that are undocumented, and that is a very serious thing and very sacred to me, the information um, that I am holding on the one hand. On the other hand, I feel like their stories are so important and they have lived in the shadows. Um, and I feel, I just am curious if you would speak to the tension between the secrecy, and the importance of the voice of the immigrants. Let's go down the line on that one, actually. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, it's, that's, there's such a, a, a need to both um, tell stories and the, to protect stories. It's, and it's, there's a friend of mine who was the first AP bureau chief in North Korea. Her name's Jean Lee. And she really struggled when she was reporting for the AP because one little casual thing you say about North Korea and somebody disappears. Not only they, do they disappear, their entire family line disappears forever. And she came back on one of these trips and one of the people she had worked with and she had written something that seemed completely innocuous and they were gone. And that has haunted her. Uh, and, and she was criticized by some journalists who really just said, you know, expose, expose, tell the full story. And she said, there's a balance between what you tell and what is going to happen as a consequence of what you tell. And it, I think especially with North Koreans, refugees these days, I worry many of my friends have written memoirs, for example, and they have worked very hard in North Korea to try to track down the families of people who have written those stories. This is a government that will not give up, that is slow and stubborn and will eventually find you. And so if they choose to tell their story, it's one thing, but I, I think, uh, you know, again, as a fiction writer, it's, it's a great protective blanket in some senses because I feel like you, I can really tell the truth. I kind of try to tell it the way it was in many ways. Um, and as an activist friend of mine said, it's finally this is out there. This is the way it happens. And yet it doesn't have to be someone's story exposed and uh, people whose lives are put in danger. But they're, it, especially reporting, I think, is very... You well, know, Vanessa, yeah, you've covered dangerous. immigrant communities. How did you manage that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is always to remember, what, you know, there's a difference between interviewing a public figure, a politician, and someone who's never spoken to the press at all. And so it's being sensitive um, to, to, like, helping them understand really what it means to have their story out there and also not to necessarily... Um, they're not people who are used to being interviewed, so I'm not going to like take the most inflammatory quote necessarily um, from what they're saying if it's not really truly reflective of of who they are or or are their, their story. Um, and I think, but there is, and, and, and I'm in a different reporting situation because it is the U.S. and we do have some uh, protections. But um, I think there is some empowerment in the sense from people who. I, I just think I shouldn't always assume, oh, this person doesn't want to go on the record. Like, I recently talked to, um, I profiled a Syrian refugee, and he's here um, with asylum status, but he gave me his first name and last name, where he worked. Like, he was fully, you know, he felt protected in that sense because his status was okay, but, it, you know, he, he wanted to tell that story because um, he felt people just are only getting one side of the, the Sy Syrian refugee experience. So he really wanted to tell that story. In other cases, um, you know, I profiled this undocumented Chinese family and they, they ran a restaurant and um, I didn't name the restaurant, didn't name their last name, but people figured it out and they started getting harassed. And of course I felt terrible, um, but they, again, they had made the, the, the calculations that this was something that was necessary for their 
to like change the whole narrative about their situation. Uh, Guadalupe, I mean, you, we talked about the danger risks to journalists themselves. So what do you, as an editor, what guidance, what direction do you give to your reporters or folks you work with about these kinds of issues relative to the sources safety and protection and the journalists themselves? Well, the journalists who are based in Mexico City are less in danger than the journalists who live in, in the countryside or in small towns and small cities. Normally, they're much more in danger than we are. So we, we, can, we, we are privileged in that sense. We can say much more things, but it's also our duty to say that. So sometimes you ask yourself if it's going to have consequences because you never know when they can start to persecute you. But since um, we, have, we are more protected, we have to, we really have to. About protecting the people, who, the testimonies and things like that, I definitely think we have to, uh, it's also our duty. We can't reveal names or even like information, as Vanessa was saying, that could put anybody in danger. We've covered detention centers in the U.S., and it would shock most Americans, whatever their political persuasions are, um, what happens, what they're like. Um, and it's, I would honor the fact that you went down there to engage directly, and it's something that most people won't have the physical opportunity to do, but journalists have been covering um, the story of detention centers and how they're growing. Um, so that's an important question. We have another question, I think, right behind you. Yep. I don't know your Twitter handle, and I won't attempt to make one up for you. <laughs> Um, I'm sort of interested in the notion of journalism versus, and then fiction both um, arriving at, at truths, very different kind of approaches to a, a, a greater truth, and what, ha what kind of thing you have to go through in terms of your mindset and how you approach, you know, approaching those two kind of different sets of truths or converging. Do you have to literally, I'm assuming, for instance, when you're writing fiction that you also have are doing, you know, journalistic work, um, you know, and there, there has to be almost some kind of overlap that's going on that you have to maybe have a divide in, in, in how you approach it, or if there's just sort of informing that's going on and you're just kind of approaching truths just from different angles. I'm sort of interested in your perspectives on that. You want to start that one? Sure. Yeah. I, people have asked me this question before, and I think they ask, like, oh, do you write fiction one day and nonfiction another? Or, like, do you turn off one part of your brain or another? But you're right. You, you can't. And I think I'm just guided by my interests about write, telling the untold story, about writing about immigration and identity. Um, and one definitely does feed off the other. Um, you know, being a journalist gives me license to go out in the world to ask questions um, and kind of, um, I, I'm, I, can, I can work with editors, I'm not so precious about my words, except when I am. Um, <laughs> and, um, but being a fiction writer has taught me like, to really think deeply about character and setting and, and a sort of narrative arc. Um, and so I think with my short story collection, um, I might approach something first as a journalist, it's the first draft of history, uh, that's the most sort of like more directly accessible thing. Um, I can write it in a number of uh, days, hours, weeks, um, whereas a short story or a novel, that's, that's a marathon, right? So the influences are not so going to be necessarily something that's so directly reported, like I, I researched this and then I wrote that. It's sort of like, what else, what other conversations was I having? What books was I reading? What, what stories? Um, was I hearing the music? And that all sort of then um, becomes my inspiration for my fiction, uh, more so than just directly reporting on one thing for journalism. Guadalupe? So I think it's like there is two movements. <clears throat> one is the writer that becomes a journalist later on, and, and, then, and the other is the opposite, the journalist that suddenly wants to write a novel. And in my case, I started first, of course, as a reader of literature, and I started writing fiction because I loved fiction. And I was very inspired by, by works on, on literature. I thought that was the more beautiful thing that a human being could do. <laughs> and as I suppose a musician becomes a musician because of that, the same reason. So 
I started writing literature and I was totally against the engaged literature. I, I always thought that literature who could only have one purpose, which was writing literature. Something beautiful, inspiring, and perhaps with a political context for sure, but not trying to demonstrate anything or um, support any cause. So later on, when I, because of the situation of my country specifically, but also because of the situation of the world, which I consider <laughs> like really um, very much worse than when I was a child or a, even a teenager, I, it, it was almost inevitable. I, or how do you say that? <laughs> inevitable. Inevitable. Yeah, yeah. inevitable. So <laughs> I started writing about what was going on and letting the reality to permeate with my fiction. And I still think that you don't have, you don't have to, you're not obliged to write to support a cause, but sometimes you just can't help it. You know, so there is a, um, a writer that I like very much. He is a French. His name is Emmanuel Carrère, who, be, who, who was a journalist that became uh, a writer. He writes literature, but non-fictional writer. And I am very inspired by what he's doing because he reflects deeply on humankind, as Vanessa was saying, but always in the context of, of politics and or what's going on. I think that he managed very well to mix the two worlds and the two different sensibilities because those are different sensibilities. Very good. All right, we might have time for one more question, maybe two uh, on the aisle here. Hey, I'm sorry. Can you say a little bit more about what's available in your heart and in your mind to do work that puts your lives at risk? Let's start with you, Chris. Wow, that was a good one. Um, yeah, I, well, I don't know. I, I didn't go into um, the work that I had done um, expecting to put my life at risk in the sense that the U.S. passport, ironically, is, 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 provides a modicum of safety. When you, when you land in a Chinese jail, most likely there's a very high chance you will not be tortured because the embassy actually checks on you once a week and they make sure you're being fed and you don't have marks on you and whatnot. That doesn't actually happen for Korean citizens and it certainly does not happen to the Chinese Korean population at the border area. Uh, but when you, uh, at least for me, when I was faced with, uh, you, the, the, I will, never forget the faces of the people I, I met and I spoke with and I lived with at the border area because the, the fear is like nothing I've ever seen before. And when you see that, you don't, you, it's not about you. It's not about your body even. You're not, it, you just want to give and help in any way you can. People who shouldn't have to ever experience what, what they have. Um, so I, I'm a total coward. I'm afraid of everything. You know, there's spiders. I, I'm, like out, I'm out the door. But uh, but but really, when when you see people like that, and and there's an identification of and a friendship uh, and a trust. Uh, you know, the kind of love and the trust that they give you as well. You really forget the self, um, and you forget your fear. Um, Vanessa. I think most of the time my life is not at risk, though at the same time, given things that are happening around the country where people, what they used to think privately inside, they're now doing, um, that is terrifying. And, but yeah, similar to what Chris is saying, like the power of those stories, um, you want to do whatever you can to get them out there. Um, you know, I've had people, people who read my column just writing me, thank you for saying what like no one has ever said out loud before. So you just, you have to keep going for that cause. Guadalupe. I think that their answers were perfect and I don't have anything to add. Well, very good, wow. Um, I think we might just be out of time here. Um, I wanna thank again uh, all of the folks, uh, not only on the stage, Chris, uh, Vanessa, and Guadalupe for this conversation. Uh, yes, round of applause. Um, <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, okay, okay, got it. Okay, this you can is applause helpful. for us again later. <laughs> well, I did have. We have time then for more questions of the audience. We got one in front here and one in the one in the back. Uh, I have one more also, um, which. Uh, and again, maybe answer this, put a filter on as we take the next couple of questions there. We do want to leave time for the lobby, though, so that is in our mind. Um, you mentioned you were first a reader, and how the experience of reading and listening factors into your ability to report and write, um, and where we are as, as a, a country, as a, as a planet, in terms of where listening fits into this hyperpolarized dynamic, but let's let's do that in the context of your question down in front here. <laughs> and you got all the time in the world, apparently. We got three hours left. So it wasn't planned, but um, that segues nicely into my question. Um, so first off, I'm a big fan of the Reveal podcast, um, and that yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and we'll be taking you up on the offer to talk about trying to meet Al Letzim. Um but it, it sort of fits into my my question, which is about um, who listens. And it sounds like your books, and also, you know, I know Reveal, um, really bring empathy and bring a lot of stories that aren't told in the mainstream. But often the people maybe listening or reading those stories are people like me, um, people who already maybe believe these things and, you know, want to see people treated equally and, and with rights. Um, so how do we get stories that foster empathy to the other side, to other people, um, so that it's not just preaching to the choir? Who wants it? Well, I think empathy is a key word for literature. For instance, when you when you read um, a story of someone, maybe if, even if it's autobiographical or not, you resonate with that story. It doesn't matter if, if it has been written in Japan in the 12th century or recently. You really listen to the voice of the writer and you recognize and, and you identify with it. So it's the power of empathy what makes that um, the literature so great. <laughs> so uh, it's the same when you write about your story, as you were saying, in an intimate way, as if you were just writing for yourself, not for anybody else, and you just say what you feel and what you think. Um, something happens that someone in another country in another time or maybe your neighbor that you never thought you were you have anything in common with him resonates with that and feels that you feel intimacy with this yeah yeah well, that's a good pairing though right intimacy and empathy are deeply connected on some level vanessa well i just wanted to say i think this is where fiction you can go stealth in the sense that people uh, your reader isn't like, ah, turning the page, you know, like, this is about not my point of view. But when they're like, oh, this, you know, I heard about this, or I saw this on the new in the collection at the library, I should get this. And then that's when you really might get someone from a far different um, background really understanding your character and, and being able to relate to it. I mean, that's, I was a huge reader as well as a kid, and ju just thinking about how people, characters with different faces from different places, and yet I still was able to relate to them and, and find that connection. Um, and especially as the American-born daughter of Chinese immigrants, books were a place where I went to find out about this broader society that I lived in, because I wasn't going to get those answers at home. And so um, I, I just really believe in, in fiction and being able to change people's um, hearts. Chris? I only have one, I guess, one small thing to add to that. Um, it may be, I mean, directly uh, to your question, that people, I, I think many people don't reach for a book because they're looking to empathize with the other and they reach more maybe sometimes for a subject or some something topical or a region that interests them. And by accident, what fiction does is that magical thing of making you almost you know, making you the other in some ways, that the other disappears because you become someone else and yourself simultaneously. So whatever reason people reach for a book, um, the, the result, uh, I think, is empathy. And that's a great thing. And I would only offer, um, we do really tough investigative reporting. The radio show and the podcast is a chance to uh, not only foreground the people who are most impacted by it, but to challenge the notion that, you know, really um, these are partisan issues. Because uh, what any demagogue starts with is, oh, they don't listen to you, 
therefore listen to me, and creates this sense of othering, which then fuels a whole uh, potential sort of tip towards nationalism, which may be happening in the United States right now, right? We have to think about that. So for investigative reporting, we must be nonpartisan. We, we have to be independent. And we also have to reach people with these kinds of stories. So that's what we've tried to do with the show. And we'll welcome you to the office, and, and you'll get to dig in. Uh, I think we've got one in the back here. Yes, in the last row. Um, one other thing, too, I would strongly encourage everybody here, for sure, but just the wider community that might get this on podcast or, or watch, uh, or watch the, uh, the video of it, um, the sense of community required to develop empathy. So uh, this is like the best book club on planet Earth happening here at the Bay <laughs> Book Festival, and, and thanks to them for this. Um, but creating community also resists this temptation to not trust each other. In the back. When people cross a border, often they feel um, not at home in the place they've arrived at. And if they stay there for a while, and even if they're able to go back to where they came from, they feel not quite at home uh, where they go back to. And, and I'm imagining that each of you has seen people try to create ways where they feel at home and they do belong. And I'm just interested in what you've seen people do and make uh, that has made them f feel at home somewhere. That was a good one. Give us an example from your Bay Area reportage. Or, or even from my short story collection, um, I wrote, a, there's this whole trend of Asian Americans or Canadian Americans going back to Asia to find stardom because the very countries that their parents left to make a better life for their children, they're going back to because they face discrimination in Hollywood here. Um, and then the, the collection of my story, he gets caught up in a sex scandal, so he has to come back to the Bay Area to hide out. So. Um, to answer your question about home, though, I, I wonder if for that character or for many people, there's no one fixed place. Um, they exist in the hyphen, you know, foot in both worlds, but not really belonging to either. And so that's the sort of, um, but but they they accept that they understand that um, you you may never have a home. I I, I would say. So that existing in the hyphen uh, is, is, let me give you both a chance to react to this. Um, North Korea, South Korea literally have a political hyphen there. Um, how are writers and journalists um, pushing that, uh, the, not only the, the understanding of the issue, but are there other writers that you would let us know about, Chris, that, that are important for understanding what's happening on the ground there? Um. Like, you know, the, the South Korea is b best at othering North Korea than probably almost any other country <laughs> in, uh, on the planet just because of the conditioning and the education that we've had. And so the, the problem has been that the, the earlier fiction, um, even five, ten years ago, very much othered uh, North Koreans as well. Um, someone like Kim Young has uh, Your Republic is Calling You is a very different kind of book. And part of it is because he, is, he, he, wa he was raised in Korea and lived here all his life, but then when he went to Canada and lived there for a few years and then was in New York for a few years and as a, as a very famous writer, one of Korea's most famous writers, traveling um, at constantly Dis, get, disoriented him in a way that uh, made him start to see everything quite differently. He was also very unsettled in South Korea as well because I guess writers in some ways are a, a tribe that don't quite feel comfortable um, anywhere. You're an observer um, more often than an actor. Um, so this, uh, yeah, the, the hyphen is, it's interesting because um, I, I, I think of sometimes a hyphen, but I also think of it as a slash because there's the, the transnational experience, which is, which is my own, you know, going from Korea to America to England to, to Korea um, and, and, and living there for a very long time now. Um, I, I, you, I don't belong anywhere in a sense. I belong and I don't belong. And depending on the year and the moment, I feel very differently about it. But like the North Koreans who drift literally from country to country at this point, I, I do feel like the home that we have is the community that you have. It's the people and the tribe, uh, maybe less the geography. Guadalupe. So I think the, the worst 
borderlines are not walls, but prejudice. And prejudice function in two ways, in the, yeah, in two, in the two senses, actually, between countries. So there is, uh, I think that literature is a very good antidote to, against this prejudice. Because when you read uh, the novel of someone that you have prejudice about, and you really are, are against his or her culture, you can understand a lot more why or, or what's going on in their heads. No, there is, uh, I've been very inspired by, the, by a text that I recommend to you all, which you can find in the internet, is a speech that Amos Oz, Amos Oz, how you say it? Yeah, Amos Oz, gave uh, when he re received the, um, the, the prize, Prince of Asturias. And it's, it's in all the languages. And he says that when you travel to a country, if you are very lucky, you might go to a, somebody's place, and maybe if you're even more lucky, you could be invited to dinner. But when you read a novel, you are invited into the into the couple's room, into the children's room, into the into the the person's head, and you can see all their their frightens and joys and and hopes and all what they are carrying on and their history. So our community actually are books. Our community is literature. I do believe in the community of people who read and who uh, want uh, to understand the other um, by the books or using them. Powerful. Yeah, I think we have one here. <laughs> it's sort of half formulated, but um, Maybe uh, piggybacking on the earlier question about uh, empathy, I guess what I was thinking about before she asked that question was um, was about complexity, and you know how you've all touched on complexity in different ways. And of course, life is complex, and it's especially complex in borders. And um, but I think one of the things that drives um, prejudice and authoritarianism is, is fear of complexity, right? And the desire for simplicity. And um, so that to me seems like one of the big challenges is, you know, yes, how do we reach, how do we uh, share, you know, reach people and um, help them to empathize, but how do we open people to complexity? Or what made you open to complexity? What makes us open to complexity? If I could just cite a short story in Natural Histories about a family that is invaded by uh, cockroaches, right? Um, and the OCD reaction uh, to, to cleansing. Um, uh, it's a little bit of a pivot, but if you don't mind me trying to, to make this pivot, um, we have a, a need, especially in, in, in big media around the world, to make these issues really simple. Immigration, we're being invaded, must build wall. Um, that story to me, I want to pass out to every American to right now. Can you talk a little bit about it and maybe react to, to her? That was a great question, by the way. Guadalupe. It's, I, I prefer that you do that, <laughs> please. But the story, it's difficult for me to tell the story because I've, I've written it, so it, it's like I will spoil it. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Well, let's just say the family goes to extreme lengths to deal with the cockroaches, and in so doing, um, must perform an act involving them that, that really sort of short circuits any sense of like the idea of cleanliness. So, uh, <laughs> you see, we could have wrapped it up, but now you got us in this direction. <laughs> there were struggles between the family, and they were, they had prejudice once against the others, and suddenly when they're invaded by the cockroach, they become one, <laughs> and they just it's spice. A suspicion against the other. Yes, yes, that idea of suspicion, let's say. All right, but anyway, any reactions to the question? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you dig in and, and treat um, your stories? And, and if I'm getting this right, I mean, you could actually re-ask it. Um, the idea of introducing complexity and having things take time and take understanding and not being able to frame them in the simplest possible terms, which I think 
You're all guilty of that in the best possible ways, actually, with your writing. Again, we could have wrapped this up three minutes ago. I mean, um, I mean, just even the notion of a, a border at all is very interesting because in some ways um, there are these liminal spaces where you're like nowhere but in both places at once. And so it's really, I mean, we too are like that. Like there's no, we can't be um, written off one way or another if you really try to understand backstory or understand motivations or, or circumstances or even structural issues that led you to become the person or your character become the character who, uh, who they are. So um, I think it's just, but honestly, how do we get more people to read it? That's what makes more interesting stories, um, conflict and complexity. And so hopefully um, people will want to keep reading the stories that we want to tell. Chris? It's, it's such a great question, the idea of how to open people up to complexity, because it, like life, like fiction, like stories, like la na non-fiction narrative, uh, the, the longing for simplicity in a world that's just tumultuous and becoming more and more chaotic and more unknowable for people is I, maybe a, a kind of instinct that many feel. And, and, and whether it's in uh, long-form journalism or fiction or, uh, you know, uh, visual narrative, there might be something to just a, 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 a compel a character, a note, a gesture, something to draw people in uh, that makes others hopefully willing to uh, explore that complexity. Uh, I think it's, it's fiction, I think the border between fiction or uh, writing in general and life doesn't really exist for me because the way we get to know individuals, it's exhausting to know someone. It's exhausting to become intimate with a friend, a neighbor, a new colleague. And the only reason one is willing to put in that work, or maybe the main reason, is because there's something compelling and human about them. And you ex learn who they are over time. And hopefully that's the thing that we can offer as writers in any form, or artists in any form, um, that will help, you know, draw people in that way because you're learning another person's experience. Well, that is going to be a powerful way to wrap up this conversation. <laughs> Thank you all for this contribution. Thank you for being here. Um, please, in the lobby, get their books. This is required reading if you want to go further on these uh, conversations. Thank you.